Hey guys, good afternoon and welcome to this video. Today we are going to discuss the solution slash the tutorial for Google Kickstart round D. This round was pretty interesting. I personally failed to solve D2, hence I got like a 340 rank. But we will discuss the solutions to all of the problems one by one. So without further ado, let's start with the first problem. So in the first problem, we are given an array of like length n and we want to divide these elements into m groups where m is less than n. So basically uh, we want to have, let's say we combine a1, a2, a3 into one group. So we want to have m such groups and we want to maximize the final value uh, in such a way that once we find make these m categories, each will have a subset of elements from a1 to a n. Once we have these categories, we want to take the median of each of this category and we want to have the largest possible median that we can have. This is essentially the problem. So uh, one thing we can consider is let's say we have uh, elements a1, a2, a3 to a n. So what happens when we take a median? Let's let me just add a few more elements. What happens when we take a median? Let's say I take these few ways. Uh, I take their median. So uh, essentially we will lose out all of the extreme guys and get some particular guy in the middle. That means uh, the guy may, the guy has to be a part of A1 to A1 to AN. For example, if I have like 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and I make a group of 3, 4 and 6, I will essentially lose out 3 and 6 and get a middle element 4. So logically, like you can also mathematically prove this, but it, it can be slightly complicated, but the logic, logically, the best thing is uh, to do is that let's say I have like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I want to make like four groups. Logically, the best thing is that all the big elements, we can give them their own individual group so that they do not fight with each other and uh, lower one of them. For example, if I had taken seven, eight and nine in one group, I would have had eight and I would have lost seven and nine both. But if I take them separately, I will get 7 plus 8 plus 9. So they are not uh, killing each other uh, if we talk in that way, uh, in that terms. So the best thing is to take the smallest possible elements and to pair them, pair them up in one group so that they essentially deal with one another and give us whatever element as possible. If we give some larger elements instead of that, it's going to be a loss for us. Because anyways, we may or may not have a higher median, but we are losing this high value 9, which we could have got individually as well. So mathematically, you could prove it. I think there is an argument given in analysis, but logically, if you think about it, it is best that the large elements stay alone by themselves and the smaller elements, we pair them up so that we will lose a few of them, but all the larger elements we will have on our own. So how would we solve this? Let's say I have, uh, M categories. So I will take the M minus one largest elements individually. And the first M elements, I'll take their median and form one category for all of them. That's how we'll do it. So let's look at the code for the same. Uh, so basically, uh, M. Uh, yeah. Oh, just a second. Let me check if I'm recording. Okay, I'm recording. So basically, uh, if you look at in the code, uh, since we have M categories, uh, you will have N minus M plus one elements over here and the remaining M minus one elements over here, thus totaling up to N elements. So if you index them, they are from zero to uh, N minus M. So what we will do is, uh, we will sort all the elements, sort, sort our array and then uh, for the elements which are from n minus m plus 1 to n, we will take all of them. So I have written from m to n over here because I was slightly confused. So essentially I just rewrote m as n minus m plus 1. So essentially what I'm doing is from n minus m plus 1 to n, I'm adding up all of the elements and from the remaining elements, I want to just take calculate the median. So how do we calculate the median? Let's say I have m elements which are indexed from 0 to m minus 1. If, uh, if I have odd, odd number of elements, then the middle element will be the median. And if you uh, figure it out, it is the index of the middle element will be m by 2. So our median will essentially be a of, uh, a of m by 2. 
where m is flow uh, since we are flow dividing essentially it will be a of m minus 1 by 2 but uh, is in c++ since the division is flow division uh, we can just write a of a of m by 2 so if we have 7 uh, 7 elements m is equal to 7 then we choose a of third a of 3 element which is the fourth element because we are zero, uh, starting from zero indexing if we have even number of elements then if uh, for m is equal to 6 uh, the your elements are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the middle elements are 2 and 3. So your element would be m by 2 and m minus 2 by 2. But since we are flow dividing you could also write m minus 1 by 2 since the one remainder we have will be gone. So when we have even elements the median is calculated by the average of these two guys. So you could just multiply them by 0 0.5 and add them up. Also remember that your answer might be in decimals. So don't use long longs or integers uh, and it needs to be precise up to six decimal elements, decimal digits. So I use a long double here and uh, using the long double I calculate the median. If it is odd, a of m by 2 and if it is even, a of m by 2 times half plus a of m minus 1 by 2 times half. Thus you finally add all of these up and you will get the total answer that you have. This is a solution for problem A. Let's move on to problem B now. Okay. Hmm. okay, so for problem B, we are given two arrays and we have we have k questions. Basically, we can choose k tasks. So let me just write it clearly. So maybe I have a1, a2, a3 up to a9, a10 and I have b1, b2, b3 up to b6 b7 something like this so what we can what he essentially can do is that he has k questions and he can either choose a prefix of a either like he can choose some element from the prefix of a some element from the suffix of a some element from the prefix of b and some element from the suffix of b these are all the elements he can choose they must total up to k elements and he will get the value of their sum and you want to have a maximum sum possible this is an interesting problem. So basically you want to maximize the value of such a subset uh, consisting of prefixes and suffixes where the total length is fixed. So one interesting thing is that you, since you like it is difficult to consider both prefix and suffix and uh, it might be harder. You might just consider instead of maximizing this prefix and suffix, you might want to minimize this subarray, minimize the sum of this subarray that you are left with. And once you minimize the subarray, you can just calculate the minimum value of the subarray and subtract it from the sum of those two arrays. So you can do sum of A plus sum of B minus this minimum of this subarray. So how would we calculate that? We are allowed for a n squared solution. So what, what idea can we use here? So basically, uh, let's iterate over how, how much length we want uh, in A. Uh, uh, so if we have total n plus m elements and we can pick any k of them. So uh, the middle, the subarray, the sum of the length of the subarray must be n plus m minus k. And we want to find out the minimum uh, sum for the length n plus m minus k. So since we are allowed for an n squared solution, what we can do is we can iterate from i is equal to 0 to n plus m minus k to choose the number of elements we want in the array A and the remaining elements that is like n plus m minus k minus i elements we will take from B. So we want to find out the minimum uh, sum for i elements from A and add that with the minimum sum for n plus, k, uh, n plus m minus k minus i elements from B and the uh, you sum them up together and you do it for all value of i and the overall lowest value you get for all values of i is your final answer for minimum of subarray. So how would we do that? Uh, the com this common simple idea is to use prefix sums over here. So we calculate the prefix sums of uh, a and b both. So what we want to do is since we can calculate like the minimum value in n square uh, in n square a time it is not very difficult let's say uh, i want to calculate uh, for i is equal to 3 uh, and i will calculate it in uh, for a 
So if I, if I tell you how to calculate let's for a particular i in a to n, we can just pre-compute all of this. We can just pre-compute all the values of minimum subarray of length 3, length 4, length 5, length 6, length 7, length 8 for both a and b. So when we are uh, just looping over i and n plus m minus k minus i, we can do that in constant time. Uh, we can do that in constant time. So uh, we can calculate this particular uh, minimum sum possible in n square time. Let's see how to do that. So what I do is uh, very simply. Uh, first of all, let's just have all the sums which start at first index. So this is what I'm doing over here. So how am I solving this problem? Basically, pre of uh, in my code, pre of a and pre of b are the prefix sums. So you can see that I have calculated the prefix sums over here. Very simple way to calculate prefix sums. Then I have two uh, arrays more, which is best A and best B. So what do best A and best B represent? Best A and best B basically represent the uh, minimum value, minimum possible sum array. So basically best A of I represents the minimum uh, possible subarray sum of length i in array a. That is what we want to calculate in best a of i and similarly best b of i. We want to compute both of these arrays. So first of all is the very simple base case. You can just choose the first i elements. So, <coughs> so initially since later I want to have like both i and j I will have as separate elements. So I will subtract from like prefix sum of uh, j at point uh, prefix sum of a at point j subtracted from prefix sum of a at point i to get the overall value of this subarray sum and compare it with the best value there. So since I'm using j and i first I will just uh, as a base case just consider where we are, do not have a starting border our starting border is the first element itself. So I'm setting best a of i to uh, prefix or prefix a of i minus 1. So basically if you want to have a best subarray of length i then you can also go from 0 to i minus 1 and to calculate the sum of the subarray from 0 to i minus 1 you can just have prefix of i minus 1. That is how I am setting the base values for a and b. Then what I do is uh, since I can just go n square I can just uh, set an arbitrary left border and arbitrary right border let's say i and j and the overall sum that we have from i plus 1 to j would be pre of j minus uh, pre of i plus 1. Okay. Sorry, not i plus 1, pre of i basically. This would be the value of the subarray which goes from i plus 1 to j. So it has a total length of j minus i plus 1 plus 1, which is basically equal to j minus i. So I can compare it with my current best value that I have in j minus i. So that is how I solve it. I have the, I go from the left border is represented by i and the right border is represented by j and I compare the best value of j minus i to prefix sum till j minus prefix sum till i. So this gives me the uh, subarray from i plus 1 to j and thus since we have n square, uh, since we can have an n squared solution we can just have all left borders and all right borders and compare it with the best value that we have for the current length. Okay, so this is how we pre-compute the value of the best subarray for a given length for both a and j and as I said earlier we will uh, iterate over all subarray sizes from O to 0 to n plus m minus k for a and just sum it up with the best sub uh, minimum subarray value for n plus m minus k minus i in b and then uh, the overall uh, minimum value that we have will be our answer. Okay, so I'm starting from a I will go to n plus m minus k plus uh, 1 because like this for loop is uh, it doesn't have the last element it is it is less than so I want to go uh, inclusive to n plus m minus k now if i is greater than n that means that I need more elements from a than are physically available in a so I don't consider this then n plus m minus k minus i is the number of elements I want from b if it is more than all of the elements in b then I just continue and then I 
uh, compare it with my current minimum answer so i have initially set my minimum answer to be 1 one, 1 one, 10 to the power 18 which is much more than possible i compare it with the minimum value we found for sub array of length i in a and add it to the minimum value that we found for n plus m minus k minus i in b and then we compare this to get our minimum possible value for a sub array of length n plus m minus k adding up both a and b but that is not our actual answer the answer that i said is sum of a plus sum of b minus minimum value of sum of array so sum of a is also the last element in the prefix sum because the last element in the prefix sum is the sum of all of the elements before so i take the last element in the prefix sum of uh, a which is sum of a then i add it with sum of b and subtract it from the minimum answer that i got that will give me the maximum border possible since i chose the minimum uh, inside elements since i minimize this value of the inside elements this one no represented in green over here a and b in the diagram so my overall b value uh, like blue colored uh, borders will be maximized that is the solution for problem b slightly tricky but interesting problem okay i hope it's clear let's move on to problem c now yeah so i hope you can read the problem one interesting thing you got to remember is that this problem has a keyboard which has like multiple elements so there may be multiple ones multiple twos multiple threes so you can't just like there is not just not one element so you have to look at all of the different elements that are possible so many people uh, didn't even attempt the problem which is like because the first two test cases were not that difficult so i will give a separate solution for the first two cases and then i will tell how we can optimize it to get the third test case correct like third sub task correct as well so what we can do basically is just consider dynamic programming so in dynamic programming i i have a dp of just a second i have a dp of i comma j Okay. <laughs> just zoomed it so dp of i comma j so what dp of i comma j represents is that uh, the minimum cost or the minimum time required to get i letters correct the first i characters in s correct while yourself being at the jth character so after typing i characters if you are at the jth character what is the minimum amount of time that you require this is what we are going to store in dp of i comma j Now, how do we calculate dp of i comma j? Since the first two sub tasks, you can just have a o of n cube solution. So let's just consider a o of n cube solution first. So what we want to do over here is that, uh, okay, first of all, you uh, uh, when you are typing the first character, you uh, you can just place your hands over the finger or the first character wherever you want. So the cost for that will be zero. So I will just move through all of all of the keys. and if the uh, value of the current value in the string is equal to the first letter that i want to type then i will say that the dp of 0 i is uh, value is 0 okay and then how would we calculate it so basically uh, we will iterate from 1 to n which is the current character that we are typing at and from j to m which is the uh, place in the keyboard that we are at so now if uh, if the current value in the keyboard is not equal to the letter that we want to type then we can't type it right so doesn't make any sense to be there so in that case the dynamic programming dp value of ij is equal to any 15 which is like a very high value so potentially these values may sum so i just chose like a value such that even if it sums m times n times uh, even if it sums n times it will not cross the long long limit that is why i have chosen like 10 to the power 15 so what we can do is since we are allowed for an n cube solution we can just have another loop which moves through all of the previous keys so the uh, keyboard key that we pressed in the previous iteration so i have a loop which goes from k uh, which is k which goes from 1 to m and it checks the previous character so if the previous character is equal to my previous character then i can go from that previous character to my current character so what we have established till now is that my current character current character which is a of i has to be equal to the current keyboard value which is b of j and the last keyboard character which is a of i minus 1 which i had to type has to be equal to the uh, equal to me typing the last keyboard value so basically it has to be like b of k 
So I literally so if b of k is equal to a of i minus one, then in one move we will go from k to j. So last at last move you were here, you were at k, and then you from k you went to j. So the this will take you a cost of absolute value of j minus k. But you already might have some cost here uh, for getting here. So that cost was dp of i minus one, dp of i minus one, <laughs> comma k. And then you add it with absolute value of j minus k to get the current correct value, which is equal to dp of i comma j. So you want to calculate the minimum such value. So what I do is check min function just checks if uh, if this value on the right side is lower than dp of i comma j, it will just update dp of i comma j. So for all of the values such that it was equal to the previous keyboard character that you had to type and um, you want to go from that character to your current character. Thus you, thus you will calculate your dp. So you go from uh, b of k to b of j, where b of k has to be equal to the last character that you type and b of j has to be equal to the current character that you are typing. This, and you will check over all of the values of dp of, uh, you will check over all of these dp values and find the minimum. And then you can just print the uh, lowest value in the final array. You, it doesn't matter uh, like after you type all of the characters, you don't care where you are at. So you can just check the whole DP, uh, last DP array, which is DP of N minus one uh, I wala array and just take the smallest element in it. So this is how you can get two subtasks, correct? This is an O of N cube solution. But now if you want to solve it in O of N square, you want to get rid of one of the loops. So potentially the final loop has to uh, be uh, like, you have to get rid of it. So how would you do that? So there is a very clever, interesting observation that we have. Let's say we want to go to this character, character X. And uh, we, we are like, the, our last keyboard character that we had to type was something like Y. And we had multiple Y's over here. We had Y1, Y2, Y3. Let's say Y minus one, Y minus two, and so on. All of these values. So one, one interesting thing that can be proven is that to get to x, the best way is to get to like is to come from y1 or y minus 1. You do not need to consider all of these y2, y3s, y minus 2s in your dp. You can just consider the element which is just to the front of it or just to the back of it. A very elaborate explanation for this is given in the analysis. So let's try to walk through that a bit. So initially I just solved for two test cases and then finally after like 30 minutes I did the did the final test cases. So this is the di diagram. So uh, see I said in the like I spoke about it as if we were in the past. So like to come to x it is best to check from just from y1 or just from y minus 1. So uh, let's try to give a logical reason for it. Let's say we are at current our current position is x and we want to go somewhere. If you and if you want to go somewhere and let's say after a few moves we know that the opti optimal position is to our left and currently we are here and we just have to take a detour to the right and then come back to the optimal position okay so what the uh, what the argument is that if we have y1 y2 y3 over here if you go from x to y2 and finally you have to come back to opt you are traveling this distance extra Instead of that, you could just go from x to y1 and go from y1 to opt, which is a shorter distance. So it, it is definitely going to be better than going to y2. Okay. Otherwise, if we were at x and we had like y1, y2, y3 over here and final, the final optimal position, let's say after a few moves was somewhere here. So in that case, if you go from x to y1 and then you go from y1 to opt, it is the same as x to y2 and then y2 to opt. You are not losing anything by choosing the first element just to the right of it anyways. Also you could have opt somewhere here between y1 and y2. In that case actually if you go to y2 you are losing. So you go from x to y2 then from y2 to opt. So you are essentially covering this extra distance. You could have just gone from x to y1 and then y1 to opt which would have been uh, much better. So finally, the argument essentially is that you just have to check the elements which are just to the left and just to the right because you are 
going to go there you are just going to go to the left uh, your absolute left and absolute right uh, elements like if you have multiple if you have y1 y2 y3 you will choose the left the one which is closest to the left and one which is closest to the right in the future like if very wherever you want to go in the future so similarly if you want if you are already at element x you must have come from some value which was just to the closest to the left and right so basically whatever we spoke about for the future like in terms of going ahead that can also be spoken to in terms of the past so if we are just going to our just uh, immediate left uh, value of a particular element we also must have come from the immediate left or immediate right value of a particular element i think i accidentally did not show my uh, ipad for some time so essentially i was just drawing out the diagram which uh, we had for which we had in the analysis which was exactly what was followed so just to reiterate if you are uh, if you optimally have to go to the left side there is no point going to the right and coming back to the left from y2 instead of that you can just go to the closest one to the right or the closest one to the left and go back to optimal similarly if your optimal is somewhere here at the very end to the far right uh, it doesn't matter if you go from x to y1 and then y1 to opt instead of going from x to y2 and from y2 to opt both are the same distance also if opt is bit say let's say between y1 and y2 if you go to y2 and come back to opt you are actually wasting all of this time you can just go from x to y1 and from y1 to opt so if you look at every case and every condition you will realize that this is the best approach to have and that is how we are that is how we are not going to check for every value we are just going to check for the immediate left and immediate right so how do we do that for that let's just uh, maintain a map with all of the indices of whichever element let's say we have like 2 we want 2 so in a map let's store all of the indices where 2 is present all of the indices where 3 is present so we can just do a lower bound and upper bound and find out the closest elements to it that is what we are going to do so we'll delete this uh, two sub task solution so yeah so what we want is uh, mm of a of i minus 1 is the last element that we had on our keyboard and mm is the map which contains the set and from that set we want the closest element to index j so closest element to index j would be just uh, to get the right side element would you just have to do upper bound so upper bound tells you the first element which is just larger than j which is present in this set and to get the smallest element we can just uh, reduce the iterator value by 1 and get the element which is just before but you also have to check if those elements actually exist and we will do that check it is not too difficult so now if uh, it does not point to the end uh, end of the set that means it actually exists so if it actually exists we will uh, do the same trick we will go from i minus 1 ending at x and then from x we will go to j and how much uh, how much we'll have to pay for that is basically abs uh, absolute value of j minus x okay and then if our current iterator was already not at the beginning if it was not at the beginning it, that that means that there is one more value which is smaller than j so we will just reduce the iterator by we will just decrement the iterator by 1 and then we will calculate from this particular position so what we are doing essentially is that if we are at some position j we have stored all of these values in a map let's say 2 3 5 6 we have stored all of them in a map and then we check for upper bound of j in this particular set not a set sorry we have a set of uh, we have a map of sets so in the particular set for the last keyboard type that we had we will just upper bound for j this value will get up get to be 5 if it exists and if it if the value before 5 also exists we will take that that is the value to this just to the left of j and we will just consider these two for our dp while calculating our dp we will just consider these two elements instead of considering all of the elements which we had for our o of n cube solution which passed two test cases so if we just check for left and right uh, guys then we can just uh, check the minimum value for our dp for that and that is the solution and then again uh, similarly we will just go to the Uh, after completing the whole string that is dp of n minus 1 we will check what is the minimum cost that we have and we don't care where after typing all of the letters where we actually end up with so we can 
any element in this DP array uh, is fine. So this is the solution which passes all three test cases. I hope it was understandable. Okay. Uh, just a second. Let's look at the final problem. The A part of the final problem is very simple. And it, it took me like 10, 10 minutes. It was doable very fast. Uh, it's like one line of code. But the D2 version is actually a tricky and I couldn't solve it in the contest. But I'll give the solution for the same as well. Okay. So let's just look at the solution for the first. Okay. I hope you have read the problem. So once we have, when we have k is equal to one case, it is pretty interesting. So if you have a k is equal to one case and let's say A says that B is not a cheat, B is not a stealer. So A says B is not a stealer. Now what if uh, B is a stealer? If B is a stealer, B is actually a stealer, that means B is one of the stealers. A lied about B, so A also has to be a stealer. So if this statement is false, both A and B have to be stealers. It is not possible because we can only have one stealer. So if anyone says that someone other than themselves is not a stealer, you have to believe it as fact. Otherwise both of them will become stealer, which is not possible for the basic test case. So that's what I do. Uh, I just loop over all of the I just loop over, over all of the statements. If anyone says the, if X says that Y is not a stealer, I just say, okay, Y is not a stealer. I just update it in my array. And finally, I just calculate all of the guys who have been proven that they are not stealers. They are proven to be innocent. If anyone says well, this guy is innocent, it is proven that it is innocent because we just have one uh, stealer. So this is a simple case. I hope that like many people actually did it because it was pretty simple. Now the actual problem actual difficult part. So one thing which I did not uh, take into consideration or take into account is that K is only till 20. K only goes to 20. So there can be maximum of 20 stealers, which is I, I just did not uh, take that into consideration. So if, uh, so how, how can we solve it? So you, the current statement is not really very nice, right? So it says that if A says that B is not a stealer, it doesn't tell us anything about A. A might even be lying. A, sorry, A might themselves be a stealer and still tell the truth. Because it is not compulsory that a stealer has to lie. So stealer may also tell the truth. So uh, this statement being correct or not doesn't tell us much. So you can just rephrase the sentence a bit. So the thing is that if B is stealer, A is stealer. This is the uh, only like useful piece of information that we get from the sentence. If B is stealer, it is proven that A is stealer. And the great thing is that there can only be 20 stealers. The awesome thing about this problem is that there can only be a maximum of 20 stealers. Okay. We cannot have more than 20 stealers. So we can just like simply uh, just iterate over these statements in a DFS. Iterate over these statements in a DFS and just once we reach 20 stealers, uh, once we reach like more than 20 people confirming the same sentence, it is proven that our guy is innocent. That's simply how it is. That's simply how it is. So we just want to uh, reverse the graph. So for example, if we have A says B is not a stealer, let's make an edge from B to A. Because if B is a stealer, A is a stealer. And then we just like, uh, we just realize that we can just start from a every point. We can start from all of these endpoints and do a DFS on this, uh, DFS or BFS on this reverse graph. And if we find more than 20 people in this connected component, uh, more than 20 people, which are reachable in this reverse graph, it is proven that uh, B has to be innocent. So I just missed this part that K, K only can go up to 20. Otherwise what you would have had is like for every vertex we are making, uh, we are having a DFS. So our solution is O of N times N plus M. 
which is not good because you just need to have a linear solution because n is too all n is still 10 to the power 5 but since k can only go to go to 20 we can just stop after reaching 20 guys so our solution is just o of 20 times n so this is a simple solution so this is the solution so we just store all of these elements if a says that b is not a cheater then we just uh, we just uh, add an edge from b to a because if b is a cheater a has to be a stealer i'm just using the word stealer and cheater uh, replaceably i hope that is fine so what we do is we have a simple we can just have a simple bfs over here and we just have a bfs over this uh, reverse map i i hope you know how to do a bfs we just add elements to the queue and if at any point if our count is greater than k which can only be up to 20 we just break 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 out of the loop and finally if we get more than 20 people who are vouching for the fact that a is not a stealer then we have to consider a is not a, sorry a is not a stealer sorry if there are more than 20 people or more than k people who say that b is not a stealer then we have to consider b not to be a stealer otherwise everyone would be a stealer so if this value of count is greater than k, we, we say that this guy has been proven innocent because more than k people have vouched for him and you just collect the number of number of guys that uh, display this behavior. So overall this problem actually is not difficult, it is pretty simple but you just have to realize the fact that you can, you, you can do a tri trivial BFS over all of the vertices one by one since you would have to spend a maximum of 20 iterations inside. Okay. There is also a proper proof why this method is actually correct because we didn't prove that if, uh, if it is not vouched by more than 20 people, then it definitely cannot be a part of the answer. That is also given in the analysis, but that is like, uh, that is too complicated uh, to discuss. You can just read it, but this is the like this is the understanding of why this method works if more than 20 people vouch more than k people are there are reachable from a particular vertex if this vertex is a stealer all of them have to be a stealer in the reverse graph that is how we just that is how we just uh, find out who are actually innocent and just add up all of them uh, to get the final answer this is a solution for all the problems uh, in the contest this contest was fun. I hope you had fun. And if there are any issues or any doubts, please feel free to ask in the comments. Hope you have a nice day. Bye-bye.